All right, so 64554, what are they covering inside that? Uh, it's gonna be things like common security threats. Uh, you're gonna be looking at uh, security and securing Cisco routers and devices. We're gonna talk quite a bit about uh, AAA, uh, the authentication, authorization, and accounting um, framework that they've got integrated throughout Cisco. We're gonna talk about the access control list. Uh, securing network management. We spend quite a bit of time on firewall technologies, um, probably one of the biggest advancements and um, most uh, secure devices you'll have on the network. Uh, great, great implementation um, as well. Uh, finally, we'll wrap it up with talking a little bit about the Cisco IPS that's contained inside the router and some of the VPN and IPSEC technologies out there. If you ever need a reason to look at uh, CCNA or just security in general, um, all you have to do is open up your newspaper. Um, cyber crimes are, are jumping forward, are jumping up. Uh, they seem to grow every single year. It's, it's one of those things that you know, an anonymous person in anywhere in the world can, can attack um, anybody else no matter where they're at. Um, and a lot of times uh, this is all targeted toward businesses. So. Um, because they've got, you know, things like their web servers or their e-commerce um, websites and stuff, we've got a lot of things going on out there, and, and it, it makes it pretty difficult to secure. And uh, we, as security professionals, we got a big job in front of us. Uh, like they say, you know, it only takes one time for those for that computer hacker to get through. Uh, you can block a, a thousand you know, 100,000 times, but all they need to do is get that one email through or that one uh, malicious packet, and uh, suddenly all of the, your work has been for naught. So it requires constant vigilance and, and a really good head, but as long as you can keep up with the uh, emerging threats that are out there, you'll do a pretty good job. The exam is 110 minutes. They're gonna give you 70 questions or so it's a good mix of uh, uh, multiple choice, drag and drop, uh, simulations, and scenario-based questions. In addition to getting your CCNA uh, security certificate, you also get a government um, or NSA mandated 4011 recognition certificate. Um, looks good on those uh, governmental job interviews. Some of the biggest differences you'll see between this one and the 553 exam is that the security device manager out is out and the Cisco configuration professional is in which uh, basically means they just switched out configuration GUIs so just keep that in mind I uh, noticed a little less focus on the whole TACX plus uh, functionality but I did notice um, some more pushes towards the IPv6 world um, bordering um, almost back to a lot of the fundamentals you uh, learned in CCNA and uh, a very, very strong emphasis on IPSEC. So make sure you study that chapter extra well. And now that we've covered everything we're gonna be looking at within this module, let's go ahead and get started. All right, welcome to Security Basics and our introduction to information security. And the primary things we're gonna be looking at is what is information security? It's the protection of our information and our information systems, providing confidentiality, integrity, and availability to our users and business systems. Really the primary security goal of information assurance is providing just that. We commonly hear it referred to as CIA or confidenti confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And just like a house, we want to make sure that those contents of structure are safe while allowing those who need access and to it and live in it. As a side note, don't forget to establish a minimum baseline on your network that you may be walking into um, to demonstrate the before and after effects of a se security implementation, like before and after snapshots. This is something uh, CEOs commonly like to see. You can actually quantify uh, what you're paying or what they're paying for, what they're paying you to do. So why should managers care about IT security? That's one of the big jobs out there is getting them to understand that um, they work as and care about assets. 
and because it's their job to ensure that assets are used to get a job done, that they should protect those assets. And your IT infrastructure is just one of those assets at a company. Unfortunately, vulnerabilities and threats are weaknesses that are out there, and the likelihood that a weakness will be exploited. Security professionals make a living establishing countermeasures to protect those assets. If you need a reason, you can always quantify it with money. Look at a company web server, for example. How much did it cost to purchase that software? How much does it cost for maintenance? How much profit does the company receive from it? You should be able to sit down with management and accounting to figure out a net worth for all the IT uh, devices in your network or in your organization. And don't forget to include all that information, such as stuff stored on the servers, records, current or projected pro projects, drawings, other intangible assets. All of that is going to build up and create your overall cost statement. And we'll be covering a lot more of this again in our security planning phase, but I definitely want to introduce you to it right now. Some of the methods for assigning value to devices, services, and reputation. You've got a couple different options there. You've got qualitative, which is a value given by a reputable subject matter expert. If you've ever watched a uh, episode of Pawn Stars, you see them constantly bringing in um, experts on certain aspects or certain objects. Um, a lot of companies will do that as well. Uh, quantitative is just basically using raw data um, and sometimes you only have this option. Maybe there's uh, not an expert available or it may just be too costly. So just trying to use raw data to determine the value and the risk that may be associated with that. But just remember both of these methods are best guesses and it wouldn't hurt to utilize both to determine a median value. Also, you got to remember the motivation of those assessing the risk. You know, for example, insurance adjusters are always going to lowball to get an estimate for the best results for their company. And where a security technician might inflate the value to elevate the security costs or how much they can charge for that. Just keep in mind the cost of security. Companies are not going to spend more than the device or the service is worth to defend it. So one idea is to calculate an acceptable security budget percent. For example, if the total cost and profit for all technology works out to $100,000 a year, perhaps a budget at 10% or $10,000 can be used to secure that investment. It's something you'll definitely have to sit down and work out with the company that you're securing. It's one of those things you want to do, especially early into the um, planning phase for uh, your security management plan. Another big task is assigning classification to data. How do we assign classification levels to data? Well, there's four major guidelines that we use. Um, a, what's the useful time span of that data? You know, information usually has a finite um, lifespan, and um, you know that's usually associated with time, just like anything. So, how long is this information going to be relevant? Really, how old is the information? Is this, you know? Uh, well known is it um, is it an older piece of information can we can we continue to utilize this are there um, things associated like design patents also you're going to want to check the assessed value if you've had an expert come in um, or just using that raw data to to figure out what a, a total value and how much would it cost you to replace this data for example the recipe for coca-cola is one of those highly guarded secrets so we would classify this as highly as possible. Here's some good classification levels to look at. Um, you'll notice we've split them up into government classifications and civilian sector classifications. Um, you'll notice there, for the government side, you commonly hear of the unclassified. In the civilian sector, we commonly call that public information. And that usually examples out to things like uh, company contact information, you know, location, stuff like that stuff you'd commonly see on a, on a website. Um, some sensitive but unclassified information in the governmental world um, translates over to the civilian world as sensitive information. That might be things like names and positions of employees. I pulled up to my bank the other day uh, to do a, uh, a drive-through deposit and I looked at the back uh, through the window behind the, the lady sitting there and I could see the entire um, corporate structure 
Um, they had a, a piece of paper taped up where it had the names, um, position of employees. You know, it's not something you want just everybody to be able to um, take a look at because they can use that kind of stuff against you, especially in social engineering, things like that. Uh, confidential information in the government classification usually translates to private in the civilian sector. You got to be careful with this um, translation because you'll notice underneath there you've got a confidential level for civilian and that's usually about as high as it'll go. But um, private information in the civilian world usually equates to things like financial data, personnel records, things of that na nature. Of course in the government you've got secret level which is about the highest they go in the civilian level translated over to confidential. We usually associate things like social security numbers and medical records, thing that's, things that need to be really highly um, guarded. And of course in the government classifications you've got top secret and maybe even things above that. And there's really no translation um, for that in the civilian sector. One of our big jobs is assessing risk. And a security assessment is an ongoing process that'll change and morph with the network. It's one of those things that's never really done. And, uh, one of those things that you really want to explain to the management of the company that you're coming into secure. Make sure that they understand from right off the bat that there may be an upfront charge for the initial securing, but we need to reevaluate this process um, and test it. Uh, and there's several different ways to do that. Uh, one is an external assessment, and that's talking about attacks from the internet. Um, an internal assessment might be attacks from the um, inside or users. There's also wireless assessments, um, overview or general assessments that give you that overall impression of, or high level overview of security on all aspects of a technology in a company. And of course the documentation and reporting of this um, to uh, analyze the security weak points and provide suggested fixes. This right here, assessing risk and all the assessments that uh, go along with it, of course in documentation and reports, this is a big, big part of the job. Um, in fact, we're probably going to dedicate almost an entire chapter to it or a module to it. Now, How do we deal with that lit risk? You know, there's several different ways. Um, if you've ever taken a look at the PMP or project management, they do a good job of really getting deep into this whole piece here. But from a security professional's standpoint, um, as long as we kind of understand the overall concepts, we'll do pretty well. Um, one of the things you can do is avoid. If you can, it's the best thing you can do and it won't hurt your project. By mitigating, um, you're basically minimizing that risk. You're using things um, that'll actually uh, minimize the effect that something would have on that. For example, a lot of times you're going to see out there um, where they have servers or maybe unsecured protocols, but those things are required in order to make the business process work or um, to make a certain software work on the network. Um, so in that case, we usually try to mitigate the, um, the risk by using things like access lists at your firewall or router. Um, and basically it lessens the effect on the project. Another way to deal with it is transfer it. And basically you're paying somebody else to accept it. Uh, commonly think of that as insurance, but you can also relate that over to security level agreements or SLAs or organizational level agreements. And finally, one of the only, uh, the last thing you can do is really accept that risk. Um, it's one of those things you want to do after examining all other alternatives and uh, usually it's considered kind of a last choice um, type option.